Hello and welcome. I am Kelsey Atwood, Tour and Public Program Manager of the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this Lunch Bite, Mapping Revolutionary New York. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, exhibitions and public programs, preservation, and providing resources to classrooms. Today, we are joined by Kieran O'Keefe, a PhD candidate in history from George Washington University and our 2019 Keith Armistead Carr Fellow. In this video, Kieran discusses 18th century map making focusing on a 1775 map of New York. Based on a survey by British military engineer John Montresor, the map, which is drawn on two sheets, depicts New York and parts of the neighboring colonies and includes the topography of the Hudson Highlands and the Hudson Lake Champlain Corridor, a region heavily contested during the Revolutionary War. Following his discussion of the map and the map maker, Kieran answers questions submitted by our audience. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about this map you see on the screen and the man who made it, British engineer John Montrazer. I'll begin by discussing Montrazer's life, then talk about the process of map making, and finally, I'll closely examine this map to see what it can tell us about New York and the surrounding region during the 18th century. As you will learn, Montrazer lived a fascinating life. He was present at many of the most important events in North America between 1755 and 1777. More generally, this talk will show that maps are critical parts of warfare during the 18th century and that they offer a useful window into understanding the past. Okay, so let's start with John Montrezer himself. Montrezer was born in Gibraltar in 1736 to a family of Huguenot ancestry. His father was a British military engineer. At the start of the French and Indian War, Montrezer was sent to America with his father, who had been appointed the chief engineer of General Edward Braddock's army. Braddock's force was tasked with capturing Fort Duquesne from the French, which is located at what is now Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The younger Montrezer served as an ensign in the 48th Regiment of Foot during this campaign and was wounded at the Battle of, Monaga of Monagahela in July 1755. In 1758, Montrezer joined General Geoffrey Amherst in an expedition against the French fortress at Louisbourg, located in what is now Nova Scotia. He oversaw the construction of trenches and other fortifications. After a few weeks, the French garrison of more than 6,000 soldiers surrendered one of the most important British victories of the war. The following year, in 1759, Montrezer participated in the campaign against Quebec under the command of General James Wolfe. During the expedition, Montrezer developed a close friendship with Wolfe, and he even drew a sketch of the general. This drawing, which is on the screen, was probably the last likeness of Wolfe created before his death at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham in September. Montrezer was also present at the battle. In 1760 and 1761, Montrezer made two separate journeys into Maine. He kept a journal during one of his trips and made a map based off his explorations. His journal and map would later be used by Benedict Arnold to guide his men to Quebec in 1775 at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. In 1765, Montrezer was stationed in New York City where he witnessed protests against the Stamp Act. When Fort George in Lower Manhattan was surrounded by a violent mob in opposition to the Stamp Act, acting governor Cal Walter Colden ordered Montrezer to improve the fort's defenses should the mob try to storm the structure. Montrezer was very critical of American resistance, calling the Sons of Liberty the, quote, sons of tyranny, end quote. When the Revolutionary War broke out at Lexington and Concord, Montrezer was again on the scene. He accompanied troops under Hugh Percy, which relieved those being chased away from Concord by revolutionary militia. In 1776, Montrezer joined the army under William Howe, which captured New York City. Montrezer was a notable witness to Nathan Hale's execution for spying. Montrezer invited Hale to spend the last few hours of his life in Montrezer's tent. After observing Hale's execution, Montrezer crossed over to American lines where he informed the Americans that Hale's final words had been, quote, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country, end quote. In 1778, 
Montrezer returned to Britain and resigned his commission. He fell into financial difficulties and landed in Maidstone Prison, where he died at the age of 63 in 1799. Okay, so now that we know who John Montrezer was, let's look at how maps were made in the 18th century. The map making process itself began with surveying. Surveyors needed to be able to measure and draw to scale. Military surveyors like Montrezer would need to measure and draw topographical features that affected campaigns. For example, land elevation was always important in determining the position of military fortifications. In addition to relying on their own measurements, map makers frequently consulted textual descriptions of the landscape through official reports, the diaries of travelers, and the accounts of explorers. Some cartographers would make maps by copying from older maps, which involved le much less work than surveying on their own. After the surveyor completed a draft of the map, they would send it to an engraver. Map reproduction involved two basic steps. First, the transfer of the image to a printer's plate, and then secondly, the printing process itself. Copper engravings were most commonly used to make maps. The map would be cut into a flat copper sheet, the ink filled the incisions, and after the ink was put on the plate, a rag would be used to wipe off the excess ink so that it only filled the incisions. The image had to be engraved in reverse. And a good, good example of how these maps and images more generally are engraved in reverse is this image here, Paul Revere's copper plate for his depiction of the Boston Massacre. Engraving workshops had assistants and apprentices, each of whom had their own specialty. One used a chisel to engrave the outlines of the map, while another would etch topographical lines. A third would etch details such as mountains, and a fourth would use a chisel to write place names. Typically, a map would be printed between 200 and 300 times. If it was going to be printed more than this, the copper plate would usually be replaced because a plate could only make a few hundred copies before it became worn. Now, what does this map tell us? What can we learn from it? Montrezer was first asked to make this map by General, General Thomas Gage in 1765. He compiled it from a mixture of his own survey, say, surveys and then from other maps of New York. Montrezer primarily relied on his own surveys for the area around New York City, but took from other maps for the rest of his drawing. He completed the map by 1767 and brought it to engravers in London but the map was not published until 1775. This map is hand colored, but there are other versions of the same map which are not, and hand colored maps generally sold for more than those that were not hand colored. This map is primarily a military map, if you look closely. It details the waterways of the region, as well as the topography, which would be critical during wartime. Similarly, it notes each fort within the province and marks the year in which it was built. More broadly though, these waterways really depict why this area was so contested during many different wars. If you follow the Hudson River north from New York City, you can see it goes deep into the continent and that it is quite wide for much of its length. You could sail up to near, near Lake George, walk for a few miles, connect to Lake George, take that to Lake Champlain, and from there, go up Lake Champlain into the Richelieu River, which would bring you close to Montreal. Because of this water connection, and because the Hudson River is navigable by large ships more than 150 miles inland, this corridor was a central battleground during several wars. When Britain fought against France, this water network offered an ideal route to travel north to attack Canada. Later, during the Revolution, the British believed by seizing the Hudson Champlain Corridor, they could win the war by splitting the colonies in half. The region was again contested during the War of 1812. The landholding system in New York was very distinct. Unlike New England, in which most men owned the land they lived on, much of New York was controlled by large landholders with many tenants, particularly east of the Hudson River. Some of these manors had been established as far back as when New York was New Netherland, while others were created in the early English period. If you look east of the Hudson River, you can see the manors of Rensselaer, Livingston, Phillipsburg, and Van Cortlandt. Staying on the theme of landholding, if you look on the, to the north of the, the northern part of the map, you can see the towns shaded in yellow. These towns are now part of Vermont, but at the time were part of what was called the New Hampshire Grants, 
Benning Wentworth, the governor of New Hampshire, began granting townships to settlers west of the Connecticut River in 1749. New York objected, saying that all land west of the Connecticut belonged to New York. In 1764, the Privy Council sided with New York, making all the Wentworth grants invalid. Many of the settlers, though, were primarily from New England, refused to recognize New York's jurisdictions. Famously, the Green Mountain Boys formed to oppose New York rule. Eventually, these towns would gain their independence from New York and become the state of Vermont. So in conclusion, I think you can see by closely looking at maps, you get a unique and important window into the past. Submitted by Jeremy from California. How were elevations and other topographical features measured? How long did that take? Are any historical map making techniques used today? Uh, so the answer to that question, uh, the most common method for measuring elevation was called spirit leveling, which was first used beginning around 1700. The surveyor would take a wooden leveling rod and hold it on a place where the elevation was already known. A telescope equipped with the spirit level, which is a tube of liquid with an air bubble, would then, be, would then be sighted at the leveling rod to establish the elevation of the telescope to the rod. After this, the rod could be moved to other places to determine their relative height based on the telescope and the spirit level. Spirit leveling is still used today for smaller areas, for example, along roads, railroads, and canals. In order to measure angles and distance, surveyors relied on instruments such as the theodolite and the sextant. The sextant is used to measure angles between the horizon and the celestial body and celestial bodies, such as the sun or a star. This would help the surveyor calculate latitude and longitude. The time it took to make maps varied depending on how much original surveying, surveying was conducted, but typically it took a few years. Submitted by Evan from Alexandria, Virginia. Through my previous reading, I have heard of John Montresor as an expert map maker. What were his official duties within the British High Command? And what did he do after the war? Okay, so the answer to this question. Uh, John Montreser was an engineer and eventually reached the rank, or this was appointed chief engineer of America towards the end of his career. He had a few different duties with the British Army. He would have made maps to be used by the military, such as the one discussed in this presentation. But his most important job was overseeing the construction of fortifications. He managed the construction of artillery batteries, earthworks, and other defenses at numerous places in North America, including Louisburg, Fort Edward, Quebec, Fort George in Manhattan, Castle William, which is Boston, Fort Detroit, and Fort Mifflin. Not much is known of Montreser's post-war life, but evidence suggests that it was difficult. His financial accounts from his time in North America were closely examined on his return to Britain, and auditors disallowed about 50,000 pounds in expenditures. To recover this money, the government seized his house in London, as well as lands he owned in Kent. Montreser apparently still owed the authorities money after this and was imprisoned in Maidstone, where he died in 1799. So it was a sad ending to an exceptional life. Submitted by Megan from Silver Spring, Maryland. How affordable were published maps in the era? How common were they among the population? And were they used practically or for display in a home? Okay, and the answer to the last question, it's very challenging to say exactly how much maps cost, but generally they were very expensive. The price could vary a bit, though, depending on the map's features, particularly if it was hand-colored. This map by Montreser is hand-colored, which would have made it substantially more valuable. By the 18th century, it was more common for maps to be privately owned than it had been in earlier centuries, but it was still unusual as a whole. You would not have seen many middle-class families who owned maps. Wealthy families might have some, and at times they did have them on display in their homes. For example, Thomas Jefferson had maps on the walls of Monticello, including a famous map of Virginia done by his father. Maps were, particularly, were practically used sometimes, particularly by travelers, explorers, and military forces. Thank you for joining us today to learn about mapping revolutionary New York. To view this item in our digital library and to learn more about our resources, visit us online at AmericanRevolutionInstitute.org.